So I'll, I'll start with this caveat that I'm, that if you guys are getting in uh, V-Ray now, it's a slightly newer version than the one we use in the office. Um, but nothing is fundamentally different. Some of the buttons are in slightly different places. I've actually went and looked at the latest version to make sure that there's no huge changes. And this the concept that we're going to talk about, which is generally a lighting concept at its heart, is the, the best way to think about how I use V-Ray. Um, and the certain render engines that we use within V-Ray are the best way to get a high quality rendering at a somewhat reasonable time frame. Um, so why don't we start here? Because I think we need to talk through the program before we can start making materials in the program. Um, so this is our asset editor. It's You can pull it up by using this little V-Ray logo. Um, it, so some of these, this, these settings that I'm going to talk about are already in this file, but I'm going to um, kind of explain to you what they are and why they're that way. And this is the also good thing is that that file that I gave to you guys, um, you could essentially open up that file and delete everything and drop your model into it. And then all of the settings should be, should be updated. Um, I'm like 80% sure that would be true if you have the latest version of V-Ray, but not a hundred percent. So you may need to readjust these settings based on what we're going to talk about, but we'll go through them so that, that that'll be clear. Um, so the first, you'll notice there's like drop downs on drop downs in, in V-Ray and these get really deep into the weeds about all kinds of very like physics based light calculations and things like that, that are sort of, um, maybe over the top and trying to figure out exactly how to make your rendering look good. And frankly, I don't use half of these, uh, like, um, operations here and I really don't need to have kind of done figured out exactly what the minimum amount of like light touch you need to have on the v-ray settings to get it to do the most for you so i'm going to just jump through only the things that i think are relevant right now and kind of skip over a lot of the stuff that really is maybe more focused for different aspects of using uh v-ray because you know it, different companies use it for all kinds of different things um but from an architectural standpoint i think I, there's only a few elements really matter. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the quality here. So you can see when I change this quality that all of these other options are changing here. Basically, this is the shortcut to dialing in what, what all of these min and max rates for the Radiance Map rendering engine do. Um, so it's sort of the easy way to think about um, your output and what you want it to be. The most important thing I want to say here is that when you increase the quality, it's going to increase the render time exponentially. Um, so the difference between a low rendering that takes five minutes, it might take, you know, upwards of like 45 minutes on high. Um, so be careful with that. Basically, the rule of thumb here is that I do all my test rendering on low. It's the quality on low is good enough for you to see what's happening, just make sure your light looks correct, your shadows look correct, your materials look correct, your glass reflections all look nice. Everything can feel, um, you can get a good sense of it. And then I turn it to high when it's time to do the final because um, it will take significantly longer. And I actually don't even go to very high. Um, I think I have maybe once when I needed to do something really, really specific with a lot of glass and metal and light calculations and it took a long time. But again, because it's exponential, like this going from high to very high is going to be a huge time jump. You can usually get away with keeping it on the high settings. And I think the latest version of V-Ray has like a high, a high plus, and then a very high. So somewhere between high and high plus for your final would work. Um, so we'll keep that out low for now as we run through some tests. Um, so the camera, um, the actual, the default that this comes at, the exposure set to 10. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll turn that back, but uh, I'll explain why I had it at nine here in a minute. Um, again, there's a lot of stuff. And, and those of you that are, are like into photography might start to rec recognize some of these dials here. 
Um, and that's because obviously V-Ray is trying to emulate what a camera does essentially um, in the way that it, it, it um, allows light in and sort of calculates that. Um, so the only thing I, I tend to play with here is just the exposure. Um, effects, I don't, all of this is, this stuff can be done much better in Photoshop, so don't worry about it. Um, render output, this is another really important area. Um, the first thing that I always do is I set my aspect ratio to match viewport. What that means is it's going to render exactly what I see in my window. So um, I don't, and that way all I can do is just put in here what I want, maybe my, my width and pixels to be, and you'll see it updates the height to match the proportions of my screen. That way I'm just always seeing exactly what I render. Um, otherwise it starts to render things that are off the screen and it's, it's, it's annoying if it's based purely by a proportion. Um, also the thought here is that you sort of render the maximum amount of stuff and in Photoshop later you use where you come in and crop it to exactly what you want to see. It's always better to have more than less coming out of your rendering. Um, so I'm going to set this to 1500, which is big enough from a pixel standpoint that I can see everything and make enough determinations about if my light quality, right, the materiality and so on. Um, so 1500 and low is a good uh, rule of thumb for just quick testing to see what things look like. Um, when I would be ready to go for my final, I'd probably knock this up to 5,000 and knock this up to high. And again, so that's gonna make a huge time difference. Um, but an easy way to think about it is the increasing the size of the image is going to change the time in a linear way. So if I made this 3000, it's going to take twice as long as 1500. So it's, 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 a, it's a linear jump in time. So it's easy to figure it out, but the quality is a little bit more complicated. Um, and I'll talk about some other things that make renderings take forever and some things to avoid, but it, um, it has more to do with complicated materials and, and layers of glass and things like that. But as far as just the overall image calculations, uh, the size and the quality are going to be the main things that matter. Um, so save image, this is really important. Um, when you turn this on and give it a file location, what it'll do is it'll just save the image as soon as it, the, the, the second it's done rendering, it automatically saves everything. Uh, which is really helpful if you're going to do on your final rendering, if you're going to like render it and take a nap or like go get dinner, you really want to make sure that it saves it because I've certainly had it where I render this um, and I'll like take a nap or something and it renders for four hours and then finishes and then my computer restarts and it never saved it. So it's really good to do this uh, for your longer renderings. That said, Make sure that once you do set it, if you are go if you have it set to say perspective L1 and then you turn your model around and do it again and render it and didn't change this, it'll overwrite it because it's always going to save it unless you change the name for the next view. So I've also done that where I've done long rendering, changed the view and hit render again, but I forgot that I had this turned on and I overwrote the first one. So just one little uh tip to avoid that um, we'll keep it off for now because we're not doing anything that's going to take that long um so all right uh image and i'll skip over uh, environment we're gonna talk about but sort of in a different way i'm, I'm gonna do it through a, a dome light rather than through my environment global settings Material override. Uh, this is a nice thing to use occasionally if you want to just look at something from a pure massing perspective. Sometimes it's nice to just turn this on and have everything be a solid color or like a light gray material. Um, so this will just override all of your other materials if you want to just kind of uh, paint a broad brush over everything real quick. Um, Swarm is all is more about just networking computers together to to sort of create render farms, which I think you need a network to do. Um, skip ray trace. So this global illumination, this is sort of the most 
important category here. Um, out of the box, when you open up uh, E-Ray, it's going to be these two render engines, Brute Force and Light Cache. That's kind of where it's like the default is. Um, so we'll start there to show you like what that what that does, but um, to show you what that does. But in general, we're going to want to change these to a Radiance Map and Brute Force as the our two our primary and secondary rays. And I'll get into why here in a minute. But let's um, let's maybe start with with this to see what that does, and then we can kind of keep making some adjustments to dial this in. Um, and then, so the rest of these, I'm not too worried about. These defaults are all sort of okay. This render elements is really an important um, category. And you can see right here, it says material ID. This is a category I added. Um, it doesn't, it, the default is like this. So I added here and I went down to material ID. And so what this means is when it renders, um, it's gonna create another file type that is basically a color blocking. It's like a flat image color blocking of the whole project, um, where so everything that's concrete will be red and everything that's glass will be blue and everything that's metal will be green. And what you can do is when we get into Photoshop, we overlay that over our rendering. It allows for a really quick way to select an entire material um, by just using the magic wand and not having to lasso around all your glass windows if you want to make the glass look slightly different. Um, I do know that this is in a slightly different location in the latest version of V-Ray. It's up here. There's a there's a, a, a little symbol for render elements, but you just click down and you add a render element called Material ID. So it's just in a different location, but it's the same thing. Um, so that's kind of our global settings here. We also have our lights here. So right now it just has the Rhino document sun. Um, and then materials, we have none because I, I took them all out for this. So just to kind of see what this is going to look like out of the box. Um, so this is a kind of fun project that's sort of halfway in the works in Detroit that in the office, but I thought it'd make for a nice uh, backdrop for this testing. Um, so let's just do a quick render and see what happens with these sort of like out of the box settings on out of the box low settings. So first thing you notice super washed out. Um, I'll get to why that's in a, in a minute, mostly because we have no materials. So everything is just white. So of course it's washed out. Um, but also the way the, the render engine for so that's the brute force engine and now the light cache, well, it went super fast because we're not a lot of light to calculate. Um, so anyway, this is our start, not super awesome, right? We're not really seeing much at all. Um, let's now go and just to be fair, I guess, let's make a simple light gray material and apply that to everything and see if that that changes anything. So under my material uh, icon here, I'm gonna go down to the bottom left to add a material. I'm gonna do a generic material. I'll just double click on it and call it light gray. And for the diffuse, that's gonna be the color. I'm just gonna set it to like a, a nice light gray. And then rather than applying it to every single one of my layers here, I'm just going to come over here and use this material override. I'll turn that on, go to the drop down, go to light gray. And now everything should be set to that light gray. So let's render again, see if that helps out a little bit. Right, so we can at least kind of start to see it, right? But again, not a great start, right? Everything is like super, super washed out. This is the number one problem I, I hear all the time is that they just try to start things out of the box and everything's really washed out. Um, so let's start to dial in these lighting settings because 
essentially if we can get this to look really good as a gray box and get all of our lighting feeling good, adding materials is super easy after that. It's all about getting the lighting set up first. So let's go back to our options. And now let's change those uh, primary rays to be the radiance map and the secondary rays to be the brute force. And let's see how what that does for us. So turn that down, click the teapot to render. All right. Well, while the image is more crisp and clean, we're still super washed out. Um, and that is because these, these engines that I have it set to are specifically designed to be worked with an HDRI. So if I go back here, um, and basically these settings for these irradiant map and brute force, if you mix that with this Rhino Document Sun, which is just set to one intensity, basically a strong white light coming in at a strong angle, um, it's going to be super washed out. So what I want to do now is add my HDRI and have that be the primary lighting source and then turn down my sun so that we're, we're using the render engine that specifically is like best portrayed by a more atmospheric lighting lighting element. And then the Rhino sun is sort of downplayed. It's just there for a little bit of shade and shadow. So the first thing I'll do is go into my V-Ray tools and under the drop down, there's the dome light. Um, so sorry, I take that back. What I should do is, if I'm doing this correctly, is make a layer called lights. Make sure I put lights on that layer. Um, it's really easy to like lose track of your lights. And then people, I, I see this problem a lot where things are washed out or there's some really big bright spot or you have two suns on and it's because things get kind of lost. So keeping everything on your lights there will make life easier. Um, right, so drop down, don't light. Choose location, doesn't matter where you choose, just need to click anywhere on your on your building. And then it's gonna ask you for a file. Um, and I need to double check if this file that I'm gonna use came with came in that package. I'm kind of feeling like I forgot to add that one. Um, but I will just grab it on my end and I'll, I can email it to you guys if I, if I didn't give it to you. Um, so this is where I just grab the HDRI so there are tons of free HDRIs online. Um, that said, I have a, a bunch that I really like that I think I got somewhere for free somehow. Um, and this one in particular, this is people non commercial HDR V111. This is the one I use for almost everything I do. It's just a really nice, even soft light with some warm tones to it. Click OK, nothing happens, right? Um, um, but let's look at my lights. So now I can see I have my sun and my dome light. Um, so if I look at this again, so hit render, we'll see that still washed out, but we have a different background. So now we can see the HDRI. This is the dome that is completely encasing my file. Um, and you can see it in the rendering, but you can't see it in Rhino. And actually, I think it's probably worth just looking at what that HDRI looks like in Photoshop, just to help understand how this how it's stretched around the entire image or around the entire file. So this is this is that HDRI. So you can see it's a, it's a, meant to be an expanded full sphere. So it has you know the horizon essentially in the center here, and the sky warps around to be an entire sphere around your project. Um, it's worth noting that it does have a sun as like the bright spot in the center, and obviously it gets to a much darker the farther you get to the the extent of that. So this seems essentially the opposite end of the sphere where it would connects back to itself. Um, the difference between this and just like a 
wrapping a JPEG around my thing is that this HDRI has light qualities that that V-Ray is able to understand. So V-Ray knows that this is the sun in a way, but I should say it knows that this is the brightest part of this image and it knows that things facing this brightest part will be brighter than things facing the other part. So it actually is going to use this as a light map onto our building. So when we look here, what we're seeing is that now in the background, how it would be mapped around in, in 360. So let's now turn down our Rhino Sun since our dome light is doing the the bulk of the lighting for us. So I'm actually gonna turn this way down to 0 0.03. Um, something I just sort of figured out by trial and error. It seems like a random number, but it's actually needs to go down two digits. So it's 0 0.03, not 0 0.3. Um, so if we look at that now, let's see if this is feeling a little bit better from the lighting standpoint. And now, we're getting something that's starting to feel um, more like we intended, right? So you can completely understand the massing of the building and all the articulation. Sure. Um, you can clearly tell which angle the light is coming from, and there's some good contrast at the corner. So this is getting much nicer from a lighting standpoint. And you can also, you know, kind of we're at super low resolution in the small image, but if I kind of zoom way in here, you can start to see the very subtle differentiation between the light, the quality of light. So there's this little sort of mini highlights of, of pinks and yellows and some purples blended in with the overall sort of warm gray. Um, and if you remember, the material that we have applied here is just a flat light gray, but the fact that it's coming out with this warmth and a little bit of um, gradient from the reflection of the sky is because of that HDRI. So that's what's giving this more atmospheric effect. And this only gets better when you increase the quality and the resolution and we start to add materials. Um, but uh, before we do that, we have to start to think about which direction this light is coming from and how it's working. So if I look at my project and plan, and then I look at my sun location. So in the properties toolbar over here, I have, you can pull up your sun. If you don't, it's not a default, but if you just click on this dial here and click on sun, it'll pop up. Um, I have this turned on and I have it set to manual control. Obviously, if I don't, I can like set this to the exact location of this project if I wanted to. But for the sake of this, I want to keep it on manual control because I want to control where my light is coming from. Um, to sort of best uh, best artic articulate the massing that, that I've created here. And so, um, you know, I, while, we're, while we're talking about this, I think I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail about just setting up composition and thinking about lighting. Um, if I, for a project like this, right, you can see it in plan, it, it basically the bulk of it is along this main street and it kind of turns back a little bit on the side street. So, our sort of most important facade is this right here with a little bit coming over here. So it makes a lot of sense to want to show this corner as like kind of the main move. But how I set up my view for this corner matters a lot. There's a big difference between this and this and this and this, right? They're all kind of in the same realm, but trying to get this exact placement right is a little bit of art. And there is some some rules of thumbs to think rules of thumb to think about when you're creating a view. Um, the first rule is you don't want to have your camera at a strange height. So generally you want to set your camera at like five and a half to six feet above the ground. Um, if you bring your camera here, which I see a lot, while there's nothing seems particularly wrong about looking at your view here, but it's a sort of strange from a scale perspective and it makes the viewer's eye harder to just quickly grasp um, how big things are because you're viewing it from like 12 to 15 feet above ground, which is not how we 
interact with architecture. We we always interact it from a first person from our own night. This is more of a like looking out your window across the street view, which is a little bit less easy to to quickly um, understand. So unless you're coming way up here and you're doing a bird's eye, which is a whole different thing, right? And that's that's also a fine image to make. Uh, but you don't want to really be in the middle. So one quick way to make to figure out exactly where your camera height is um obviously there's your z location or your z yeah your camera your z location and you can see um so my models in inches so this is set up here so i can put this at you know basically 72 inches and know that i'm i'm in the right spot um but if you're slow your your site is on some slope or your model's not exactly at zero zero one easy thing to do is to just make a little um, reference line here. So if I just make this six feet tall, really wide, really along this way, it'll sort of use the rules of perspective to tell you how close you are to being at um, six feet off the ground. So I'm going to get it kind of close here where I think I might want to be, but then the other, the second most important rule is to be always be doing your street perspectives or your or your exterior perspectives at a two point. This will make sure that all the vertical lines are are, are actually vertical. Um, so now what I want to do is set up a view so that I see the building the way I want it, and my camera's the right height, and I'm showing the right proportion of front and back. And so you'll notice if I as soon as those two lines cross, that means that that is our my horizon line, which means it's at my eyesight for the camera. And it means that I'm looking at it from exactly six feet. And if you actually see that little scale figure way in the distance, you can see that they're right at the top there because that's probably a six foot tall figure. So now I know that I'm at the right area, but obviously I'm cut off a little bit here. So I have some options. I can obviously back up a little bit. Um, and if you don't know this about Rhino, just a little tip and trick. If you hold control and um, slide with your right click, you can zoom in and out of a way that's way more precise than with the, um, the mouse wheel. And then obviously if you hold shift, then you can pan a little bit. And that's what those are going to do to sort of get this view set up where I want it. So... The other issue that you can run into is that maybe you don't want to be this far away. You'd like to be a little bit closer, but looking up a little bit more. So what we can do is just rotate the camera up a little bit and then pan down and then zoom up. So now I can see that my camera is perfectly aligned and I, I don't, need a certain amount of sky above here. I just need to make sure I'm not cutting off my building because I'm going to add the sky in Photoshop later anyway. I just want to make sure I'm not cutting off my building. Um, the other thing that I do from here is start to think about how much of each side do I want to show. And one easy, it's going to be different, obviously, for every building and every composition. But one simple rule of thumb that I like to go by and I can just draw here is just to think of like the, the general bulk of your massing and keeping your corner on a third so that you're keeping two thirds of like your made facade and one third of the secondary facade. That's a, just a simple composition thing of basic, basic architectural photography and render image making, which kind of go hand in hand. Um, that will make give a nice balance to the image. So this, I can see that my camera's at the right height. I can see I'm not cutting off here. I have a nice balance of my primary facade, secondary. So what I would do is then save that. Um, which, so I have that set, so I can always can come back to that view. Um, and all of that is to say that I want to make figure out what my main view is so that I can figure out where I want my light to come from.
Um, so now that I know where my primary facade and my secondary and where I want my light to come from, um, depending on you know how your site is situated and um, sort of the, the main design goals, the sort of rule of thumb about where your light is coming from is that you want it to be coming away from you towards your primary facade. So as opposed to behind me towards my primary facade. So I want my light to be coming from this way as opposed to this way. Um, and the reason for that is that I want this facade to be slightly darker than this one. And so if my sun is hitting this coming from the right, then it will, this, the shadow will kind of run off this way. Um, and what that's going to do is keep your building from looking very flat. If you have your sun coming right at the corner, this side and this side are going to, the whatever material they are, are going to start to have minimal contrast because they're getting evenly lit, which is going to make your building look flatter. So thing, little subtle things like this can really, um, you know, start to make your building shine a little bit more. Um, so that said, I'm going to look at my project in plan. And so I, I want my light coming from, you know, in this plan, which is basically the Northeast. Um, so I'm just going to manually move it that way. So I can just grab this dial and have it coming in that way. Um, I'm going to change the sun angle down just a little bit here. So it's not quite, um, if I knew. Um, so that's great for my Rhino sun, but my V-Ray, if you remember, has its own sun in it. And so how do I rotate that dome? so that that middle sun is coming from the same direction as my rhino sun um, because i don't want that v-ray sun to be hitting one side and the rhino sun to be hitting the other side so then it gives this weird like the shadows are going one way but this side's slightly brighter it'll get confusing and your your eye will immediately notice that something's wrong so if you remember when i dropped in that hdri it created this little uh arrow here and so this arrow is pointing to the center of the image. So if I look in Photoshop, it's pointing directly at the sun of this image, which is the brightest part of this image. So if I go back here, I know that, and if I look at it in perspective, if I was, if I were to render this, I would see the sun right here. But I know I want the sun to be coming from right over here. So what I do is just rotate this in plan to be facing where the sun is coming from, which is more like that. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's Remember, this isn't casting shadows. It just needs to be generally coming from the same area. Um, and this HDRI light is very imprecise. It's just sort of a general glow and warmth. Uh, but you do want it coming from the same direction. So this is pointing at the sun, which is in the yeah. northeast. And then in my sun position, it's coming from the Northeast to the building. These things are aligned with each other and they will uh, render correctly. So let's go back to my view I just made. Um, and our settings are good. We have our light on and we have our uh, sun. Set that we and we reduce that quite a bit down to 0 0.03. So let's now right. hit render to see how that looks. So now the building feels, um, you know, a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more contrast at that that hard corner here, and we're getting a nice amount of general light over everything. Um, and you can even start to see that like down here where the angle of view reflects more directly at the sun that it's just just slightly brighter than maybe over here um and that's very subtle little gradient there um which may not even come through on the screen on it on through over the zoom honestly but these little subtleties that we're going to be dealing with here are really what 
V-Ray is all about and what makes a great rendering. It's just a lot of really, really subtle adjustments to reflectivity and light and uh, materiality and texture that's really going to make this feel nice at the end. Um, so this is all set up well now. Let's go back. Well, I'd say this is set up, but I would say it could be a little brighter. It's just a little bit on the dark side. Um, and that's where I would come in and just change my exposure. So the lower exposure, the brighter it is. So I would just drop this down to nine, just as a subtle adjustment to see, get my, you know, out of the box grayscale rendering. And you can see that difference that that from 10, 10 to nine makes. This from a lighting standpoint is more where I want to be. Um, it has a, a, a certain amount of brightness and warmth to it as a, just a general starting point. And if you can get your project to look like this without any glass or any material materiality, it's in a really good spot to just um, start applying materials and make it come alive. Yeah. Um, cool. So I guess let's do that. Let's make some materials. So go to our material layer here. Um, before I make a material, what I want to do is go to Photoshop and talk about, before I make it a B-Ray, I want to talk about making it in yeah. Photoshop. Um, let's, well, let's think about what we're going to make here. So, um, the first material I want to add is, well, this material is, supposed to be brick, but maybe maybe it's more fun to just do something different. Um, let's just see what it would be if this whole thing was like board form concrete, just for fun. So I'm kind of sick of looking at this and, you know, the material that it was meant to be. Um, if we wanted this, all this like horns there to be like a board form concrete, um, how could we create that material and create the texture that board form concrete has? and then apply it to our building at the proper scale. It's kind of like the big jump we need to make. So first thing we do is open a file. And I did give you this. Um, so yeah, just open it from the same folder. Just use this concrete medium. Or no, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna open up this wood decking because if we're making board form concrete, it makes sense to start with some boards. So this is just a simple wood decking texture. I found this online for free. Um, but what is great about this is that it's seamless, which is something that you always want to make sure you find. Um, and if you don't know if it's seamless, you can always check really easily by just going to image, canvas size and making it um, significantly bigger and so I just made my canvas bigger we grab my my wood here I can hold alt and shift and snap that there and I can see that this is designed to be completely seamless so that when I copy it, um, it's just gonna look like more wood, which is really important. And if I do it again this way, um, that's also the case. So this is a, a completely seamless wood texture, which is exactly what we want to be working with. Um, you can find these all over the internet. I can most anytime I need to find some new material I want to work with, or at least a starting point for material I want to create, I can usually find some sort of seamless starting point. Um, CGtextures.com is also a great reference that I think you have to set up a free account, but they, they allow like a certain amount of free downloads a day and they have really high quality, high resolution, seamless textures of almost all types of brick, concrete, wood, um, you know, the most straightforward options. Um, and so now that we have it here, what we want, we want this to look like concrete. Um, I guess before I do this, I just want to stress this idea of 
making your materials from scratch rather than just using what V-Ray gives you or what that you can find to download as a, a V-Ray material. Um, this kind of goes back to just having more authorship of your choices in materiality and not just selecting from a list. So maybe it's more like looking through some precedents and finding something you really like and, and like whatever you're kind of imagining in your head it should be for your project. And then finding a good starting point and building that as a seamless material and then creating a bump map from it and then using that material that you've made to be specifically your idea. Maybe even if it's like a, some sort of stamped concrete, you're deciding what the portions are and how that's gonna put together and you build a swath of it, and then you use that to apply it over your building. Um, it's more important to just be thinking about what you want it to be and not what material is available. Because from just a, a straight JPEG, you can find any material that you want. But as an already pre-made V-Ray material, you're going to be used to limited really quick. And then not to mention that the materials that V-Ray has within the program are fairly limited and not awesome. I mean, even in these like bricks I look at them, they're, they're not great. Um, they're very boring and flat. Um, there's some, there's like a couple decent ones in here, but 90% of the material materials that I use in V-Ray in the office, um, as well as everyone else here, we're making from scratch based off of maybe a product that we see or um, you know, an idea we have in our head. So that's a long way to say that part of making this board from concrete from scratch and going through this is to get you thinking about making the material that you want to use for your project and not just uh, what's available. So we obviously don't want this to look like wood. So making this look like concrete is pretty straightforward. We'll just go to uh, hue saturation, take all the wood color out of it. Okay, brighten this up a little bit. Play with the contrast a little bit, a little bit down. And yeah, it's probably okay. Maybe it's a little bright for concrete, but something sort of like this. Keep in mind, we're gonna. This is going to feel a little flat, but we're going to we're going to be controlling the reflectivity of this and the texture of this. But just from a squint your eyes and what does it look like? I would say it has that board form concrete feel. Um, so I'd immediately save it as a copy as a JPEG, and save it as board form concrete. That's good. Um, but now, while we have this, we also want to create a bump map of this. So the bump map is what's going to give you the texture and the rendering so that you don't have to model individual seams or reveals or bricks. Um, you can use this image to be that map for you. And the way those maps work is that everything that's black is going to be uh, set in and everything that's white will be proud of the image. So if this was just black and white stripes, the way it would read as a bump map is just uh, vertical grooves. That would be the recess. So I want those little grooves in there to feel like the gaps between the boards, but I also want um, a little bit of the wood grain as well, because you know when you see that it's a nice board from concrete wall, it does maintain a little bit of that grain. So. To do that, what I just do is go to my brightness and contrast and really like wash this out. Again, I'm only, I'm trying to deal with mostly the extremes here um, because it is a pretty sensitive map the way it works. And so here, what I'm gonna get are all the grooves as well as just a little bit of wood grain noise. So I can see a little bit coming through here and also just a little bit of variation. So I can see somewhere some boards end a little bit and that'll allow that sort of running texture to go along with the grooves that go along. Um, and I guess now that I'm thinking about this, in theory, it would be the opposite, right? Because you would want the where the boards come together and the concrete kind of oozes through, I guess it's a little proud and not recessed. So what you do then is go to 
uh, image adjustment and we would just invert this. And now what we would have is these vertical lines would be slightly proud because if you, you know, unless uh, a board form is always like a little bit that kind of seeps through, but then these, uh, you're still going to get that little bit of that wood grain on there. Um, so then I would save this. So yeah, I'm going to adjust the system a little bit more, I feel like. I'm going to bring in a little bit more wood grain, so maybe a little bit less contrast. Something like that does a little bit better for my bump map. So I'll save this as a copy. I'm going to call it the same thing as my other one. I'm just going to add the word bump at the end so that I know that this is the bump map for that specific JPEG. Click OK. Um, so now I have the elements I need. In V-Ray, what I want to do is create a new generic material. And doing this in the latest version, it looks slightly different, but the options that pop up are, it's just a little bit of a different way that it pops up, but it is still just creating a generic material and calling it So to make, the first thing to do to make this material is um, in the diffuse layer before we were just picking a color, right? If I just pick a color, it makes it a color. But if I click on this little mini checkerboard here, this will override that color with a bitmap. So I will select bitmap and then I will go to um, where I just save that. So there's my copy, open that. Click back. So now you can see it over here. I can actually change the way you view this. Um, so this little preview over here is gives you a general idea of what the material is going to look like, but it's not perfect. So don't don't take it to heart too much. Um, next thing I'm going to do is go to my maps, go to my bump map, turn that on, and again I'll select my little checkerboard to I can pick a bitmap, then I'll select my bump file, click open, go back. So now that's on there again. It's never going to read super awesome on this little sample here, but I know that my bump map's on there. I know that my material is on there. Now the only, there's a lot of other options here, but I really want to focus on reflection because every Every object reflects light to some degree. And so getting that perfect amount is really what's going to make this look like concrete versus plastic versus metal. Um, so the reflection color works on basically uh, black to white gradient. So if it's set to black, it's basically saying this has no reflection. Um, and if it's set to white, it's has full reflection, which you can see here is starting to look a little maybe like plasticky at first. So for concrete, I'm actually going to keep this higher than you might expect um, because concrete is reflective, just not in the way that you think about it. It's reflective in that it's like reflective of light. It's not reflective in like that you know see yourself in the mirror with it, um, and that is really going to be controlled by the IOR and the glossy. Glossiness. So if I just click on the IOR, 1.6 is sort of the minimum default, and that's fine. We'll leave that there. We would only turn this up for things like metal and glass and chrome or something like that. Most standard masonry kind of stuff, they are reflective, but just the default one of six is about right. Um, but this glossiness right here, this is going to be the main thing that determines the, like how how sharp the reflections are versus being matte or, or blurry. So I'm going to turn this way down. So this maybe goes to 0. 0.65, we'll say. Um, and the highlight glossiness as well, I'm always going to turn that to match. So these, while in V-Ray, they do a very similar thing. You do want to make sure that you turn both of these on because Enscape 
interprets these materials slightly differently. And Enscape only doesn't have a button for reflection glossiness. It only has highlight glossiness. So that's why I just make these the same because um, they're, they'll end up looking the same in V-Ray, but this will make sure that if you do need to open up an Enscape, it'll also look the same there. Otherwise, when this is turned off, Enscape just gives it the default one and it makes everything incredibly reflective. So this is your best way to turn that down. It's your highlight glossiness. Um, so when I look at this here, now it doesn't look like this is shiny anymore, but it is reflecting light like concrete does. So I feel pretty good about where that is. Now let's apply it to our building and take a look at it and see if it feels right. So I, the best way to apply materials and um, to your to your project. Um, is to do it by layer. I know I see a lot of students click on something and they apply a material um, by an object. Um, that is going to lead to a lot of messiness down the road. The best way is to be organizing your your layers based on material. So if I go to this exterior material, which is labeled as brick because that's what it used to be, but we're gonna make it concrete for this. Um, so that's right here. Just click right here on the right, this material uh, column here, it's just, it's just a blank dot right here. If I click on that and then go to the dropdown, I think in the latest version of this, it, the material will be in this dropdown, but in this older version, I just have to go here and then go here and go here um, and find that board form concrete. Okay, click OK. And now if I look at it in render view, you can see it's there. Um, but it's coming in vertical, which maybe we don't want. Um, and the scale of this is actually coming in based on uh, whatever scale I had my brick texture to. So it's not quite right. So what I'm going to do, let's stay in render view, is I'm just going to click on just one piece right here. I'm going to go to my texture mapping and I'm just going to delete mapping because I think I had some old mapping left on there. So this is kind of, let's do that for everything. I'll select all the objects and just turn it off. Okay. Uh, anyway, so when this just comes applied to objects, it's going to be completely out of scale, right? So I'm just going to pick a piece right here in the corner. I'm going to use box mapping as a way to map this on. Um, there's a lot of different ways of mapping materials, but box mapping works for 95% of all architecture projects, unless you're doing some like very spherical, like wavy structure. You might want to use the spherical mapping or the cylindrical mapping, but generally the box mapping is the way to go. Um, and for the texture, it's going to ask you for the first corner of your bounding box. So the bounding box is essentially going to be how big it scales this file to be. So how wide and how tall this should be so that it looks like it is in real life. And for something like this, what you can actually do is just count these boards and then decide how wide the board is. If these are six inch wide boards and you count how many of them there are that you know what scale this is in real life. Um, and then you can imagine, you know, it's sort of like 125% tall as it is wide and you can kind of figure it out. So I've actually already done that because I use this material all the time. And so I know when it, when it wants to make a bounding box, that it's 15 feet by 15 feet by 20 feet. Click enter. So now I have my actual boards there and I can actually come in and just measure them to make sure they're the right size. So I snapped just in front of there. 
Yeah, so seven inches. So they're a little bigger. They're like six and four. It's a little over six inches, but that's all right. Um, but I want them to run horizontally. This by default, they're coming in vertical because my image is vertical. Um, so if I go to show mapping, it'll essentially show that 15 by 15 by 20 uh, foot box that I made. And everything I do to this will change the mapping in exactly one to one. So if I rotate this in 3D along the Y axis, it's going to rotate that whole image for that one surface. Um, and if I move it too, you can see it'll just it'll move along with it. So I can change where it starts, and it's going to just follow that around. And this this mapping widget can be manipulated just like any object. I can scale it 1D, I can scale it 2D, I can rotate it, I can mirror it too, which sometimes you need to do to get the texture to feel right. Uh, what you cannot do is copy it. It won't let you. So if something just feels like it's not working, sometimes if you want to mirror it by default, it'll want to make a copy and it won't let you do it. So the, the reason it won't is because it's trying to uh, make a duplicate. So now that I feel like I have this piece right, what I'm going to do is select all my bricks. So I go to my brick layer and uh, go to select objects. So there's all my brick. I can use this match mapping and just click on the, the one piece that I know is correct here. And now everything matches that. So now I have my board for concrete all over my whole exterior sort of shell of this building. And we can come back, go to our save view, and maybe take a quick peek about how that's feeling. So the reason it didn't show up is because, if you remember in the beginning, we turned on the material override. So we are overriding every material with light gray. So now that we're not doing that, I turn that back off and this will, so that'll fix it. So two things are happening. One, the image feels washed out again, and that's because we have a white street and a white sidewalk, which is reflecting a lot of light up um, on our board for concrete. So while this is starting to look okay, our uh, everything else is a little bit of a mess. So what I'm gonna do just real quick for the sake of visualizing this, um, so I'm just going to make sure I put some of this background stuff back on that light gray layer. Even better idea. Just because, so if I turn that back on, what I can actually go to is go to my board from concrete and go to environment overrides. Ah, so on the material options can be overridden. So if I turn that off, that means it cannot be overridden. So therefore, this way I can have everything be light gray except for my new material. So I'm just going to remember to do that for each one so that I can keep, so I don't have to attribute every single other layer to light gray right now. So let's see what that's a little bit less crazy. All right, so I see my board from on there and I can actually see, so again, I'm gonna use a little bit of imagination because we have super low settings just so that it doesn't take too long to render. You can see these little like kind of like light speckles here that are sort of hitting those, um, uh, the what would be the, the kind of concrete that like seep through the, the wood just slightly. And it gives that little sense that there's like a, a little beam of concrete um, that's a little bit proud of like the main surface. So these are the little subtleties that will become important to make this look real. Um, again, super low res and hard to see right now, but we'll add a few things and we'll up the resolution and then we'll just render. Actually, let's just do that because we can just, it's a good thing to talk about as well. So just so we can start to see that a little bit better, I'm gonna go to media. Um, and we'll bump this up to 3,000. So I do want you to kind of see what these changes are doing to the material.
you can also get a sense of how much slower this is going to be, right? So it's a lot more pixels to figure out. It's still moving pretty quick because at the end of the day, we only have one material in here. So this shouldn't be too long. Things start to get slow when you have lots of different types of glass and lots of different types of reflective materials because it has to like the light has to bounce and it has to calculate that. So now if I start to look at this material, right, I think still not totally perfect from a quality if I zoom way far in, but if I just kind of zoom out and get a sense of the reflectivity that's hitting that and the little groove that's happening on there because I inverse that so that that little white line would be the, the proud point of um, this material, it's starting to give that sense of like a board form concrete wall here. I'd argue maybe my scale is a little small, this board might be bigger, but the look and feel of that is starting to be right. And what I can also do, if I really want to test something out, if I want to turn this up high, um, but I don't want to render the whole image, if I go back to the here, there I can go to uh, um, this like render, this like teapot with the little red line, and I can just draw a little box and click render and it'll only redo it in this area and this area will be done i just change it to high settings just to see if i can make that look a little bit better you know i turn it on and off you can kind of see the difference right at that seam see how see how this is a little cleaner than that is that's the difference between medium and high um, Again, and if you make your image 5,000 pixels versus 3,000, then things get better as well. But we're pretty far zoomed in. But you can see, like this has just a little bit more noise than this does right here. So you can just start to understand what these settings do and well, how much of an impact they make. But I think this material is starting to feel pretty good overall. So let's go focus on, um, let's see, we've got like another 15 minutes or so. I'm going to try and keep this somewhat time. I know following along to me talking for an hour and a half. It's exhausting. Um, so we're, I'm going to turn that back down a little so these test winners don't take a long time. But uh, let's talk about glass. It's, um, you know, basically any other material we make is going to follow the same logic as we just did for that concrete. If you're going to do brick, you find your brick JPEG, you make a bump map for it, you bring it in here, you control how much how reflective it is, how bright the reflection is, and the added bump map. It's the same thing for standing seam or metal, or most any um, so opaque material. But glass is tricky, and glass is kind of the most. I'm. The, it's it's going to be a prominent material in almost everyone's products. I'm assuming. Um, so I'm going to do you guys a favor and just give you a glass material that I have made that I've been fine tuning for years. So um, actually, I think I forgot this too. I will, is Lachelle still on me? Okay. I, okay. Um, I will send an email to Lachelle to distribute to everybody with the HDRI and the glass material. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, um, so glass, this glass. So this glass, um, we can just look at it real quick, right? So the diffuse is kind of this like light blue, but if you jump into reflection, you'll see the big difference. Remember, I was talking about that reflection IOR. You can see this is up to twenty. So this is significantly more reflective than concrete, which makes sense. Uh, but also under the opacity, I have it at sort of like 80%. So it's, it's not only is it reflective, but it also is transparent so you can see past it. And so fine tuning that reflection and transparency is sort of key to getting glass to read right. The other thing that's going to be key to glass is understanding your exterior light versus your interior light. So 
the easiest way to think about glass is that or reflections in general that they always reflect whatever is lighter um which is something we all know intuitively know but you don't really think about so when you look at a glass window during the day you see more sky reflection because the outside sky is brighter than the inside of the room even if the lights are on because the the, that the, you know sunlight is, is so much brighter but then at night you see directly into buildings because the sky is dark and the inside is bright so the reflection there's you don't see the reflection of the night sky because it's brighter on the inside of the building um and so the key then to really make your glass sing is to have both right so you can see a little bit inside and a little bit outside which is why you see most architectural photography is kind of done at that magic hour. And that's because the, the, the light temperature outside matches the light temperature inside. So when it's the same brightness in both, then glass looks the best because you can see both. So this glass it's, it is designed to do that. But what that means is that you do need some lighting on the inside of your projects, which I'll talk about as well. And that, I think that'll probably be where we'll end after talking about that because they kind of work in tandem. And also this this interior lighting trick, I think works really well for residential buildings, um, which is what you guys are doing. So let's put that there. I'm going to uh, also make sure it's not, it can be overridden so it doesn't, so it shows up. And I'll go to my layers. I think it's on A class. Um, and here I browse. And class will go to each one. Okay. Okay. Um, so this class is in there now. Let's quickly take a look at it. So what we're going to see is probably reflection. And it's maybe a little bit too strong, but it's just kind of a starting point to get this glass to look great. Uh, while this is going, I think it's important to note that the the HDRI as our primary lighting source is not is one because it makes for a really nice light over the whole project, uh, but two because it actually is there as a element and the way it's rendering, it gives your glass something to reflect. So now my glass is reflecting that HDRI. So this is actually seems to be reflecting right into the the bright spot, which is a little bit um, I don't know distracting maybe, but. What is nice is that when you see some of this glass over here, it just has these like nice, subtle, soft um, sky tones here in the reflection. Whereas if you just are rendering this in Rhino, um, it's just going to be white or black, or you can make it look like a bluish tint. But this actually gives some variation between every single window. So this already starting to come to life, come to life a little bit more. Um, but what we want is to actually see inside this building a little bit, right? And we're not seeing inside at all because there's no light inside, it's just a closed box. And while this window is 80% transparent, it's not gonna let enough light in to light up the whole space um, in a way that makes it even comparable to how bright all the sky is. So let's go ahead and look at create a material that actually does brighten this up. Um, so there's a number of ways to do this. The way that would look the absolute most realistic would be to go in here and add point lights and come into your building uh, in every single room. Well, there's no groups in here. And just put in all the like can lights for every single unit um, so that there'd just be like this really natural feeling lights on and off in the whole building. One, that would take an incredibly long time to do. And two, you're going to end up with hundreds of lights. And that's a problem because the number one thing that slows your rendering down is adding lights. 
because every single tiny point light you add, even if they're not in the physically same space, Vray doesn't know what's in a space or not. It just knows a light source and it knows another light source. And it has to do all the math to calculate where those light source are bouncing around and what they're hitting and what they're not hitting and how many times they bounce around before they trail off. So it has to run the calculations for every single light that you add and every single wall it's going to hit and bounce around. And that's what really bogs down. V-Ray is adding tons of point lights. Um, it can be done, certainly. And if you have an incredibly fast computer, you can do it. Or you can be a little bit more select about where you add your lights. Um, but what I've found is a great workaround is instead of adding lights, I put a material on the wall and that material glows slightly. So it looks like a wall being hit with a light source. Also, the material is going to have a little bit of like some like paintings and a TV and it's just a little bit of noise so that it looks like it's activated. And that allows for the illusion of a room with a light turned on, but it's just a glowing surface and it's glowing in an emissive way and not in a projecting way, um, which is different in the way that it is calculated and therefore doesn't require more rendering time. So let's, let me just explain that by making it. Uh, so I'm going to make a generic material, call it interior walls. And for this, I'm going to click on my bitmap again. And I know this wasn't that folder on capacitors. So the material I'm going to pick is this one. I'm just going to blow it up a little bit so I can talk about it before I apply it. So this is a material that I just found some like dumb generic interior wall elevation. And I took it into Photoshop and I kind of exaggerated the contrast. And I made it sort of like overly yellow and warm. Um, and the idea is that this generic wall is we're going to take this and we're going to apply it to all of our interior walls as a way to make it look like there are lights on on the inside of this building. So I'll select OK back so this is just a, basically wallpaper right now but if i come in here and add an emissive layer so just adding a layer here emissive which now this is a, like a glowing light bulb instead of my color i'll just select that same image again while it may look the same here now this is a basically an led screen of a fake wall um so i'll just leave that as it is and then what we have is oh we have a way to kind of play with it by and controlling the int intensity and the transparency so if i turn this all the way off to white then we're just seeing the wallpaper underneath or this is all the way glowing um i think yeah this model doesn't really have as many interior walls as I thought it did. Um, that's right. Uh, I think it's enough. Okay, what's that? Okay, I do have an interior walls. So if I go to my so I have interior walls and interior walls lobby interior walls cafe all right i'm just going to select all of them so for all of these interior wall layers i'm just going to put them on all of them select a material go down and we'll go to my interior walls okay okay um, so this, that elevation does have a scale to it. So I need to come in here and scale this. If I look at this in rendered view, it's not going to show. Yes. I have some different settings for my rendered view, so it's a little hard to see. Um, but it is on in there. It's just that you can't see it. Um, 
Yeah, so this that material is sort of wallpapered on here, so I just need to scale it. Um, I can't quite see it, but I just know what scale that image is supposed to be. So I'm going to select it. I'm going to go to apply box mapping. And just like I did before, I know that this that elevation is 20 feet by 20 feet by the height of floor to ceiling. Click enter. And then I'm going to select all my objects and match that. And let's just quickly take a look at that. And I might need to adjust some of the mappings because I they're on different floors, but let's just see how it looks. That's how it view. And so we'll take a look at how it looked before. And the render, let's see, let's see the change. And this was a bad idea. Turn that off so that we can actually see it happening. Because um, nothing was happening because I had it on. It was being overridden by that that light gray again. So those interior walls aren't on. They're not set up right now. That I, I don't have one for every what would be bedroom in this because this is, the interior is not modeled. But where it is modeled, we can zoom into it, kind of take a look at what's happening. So if you look in here and you see that line, um, actually, that's not the right one. That's just my material not being in the exact right spot. Um, but you can start to see the interior face of that wall a little bit. And it makes sense that you would see it here and not see it here because of where, well, one, the proximity, but also that this is in shadow from that terrace. So therefore being in shadow, the brightest spot is gonna be the sky where here it's getting hit. And then that's so you can see the interior wall beneath it. And then you can start to see that wall through the glass here, but you also see the warmth of that reflection on top of it. And then go back in and adjust something so that it's a little bit more obvious here. Just fix that interior wall. Wow. Also going to I'm just moving these mapping widgets to their appropriate location so that their scale matches where they're supposed to be. I'm also going to we look at, I'm gonna try and make this window, these two windows in particular, so that we can see this a little bit more clear. There, so you can start to see the difference that makes. So this is the kind of look that we're going for here. So if I actually had interior walls for every one of my units, and I can apply that layer to each one, it would start to look like this window, right? So one, we start to see these lines here and what that is is the line between the wall and the ceiling and ideally you can get those so where they're coming you'll see the perspective lines moving away which gives you some depth of the building but also just this little noise right you can't quite tell that those are shelves and a tv and like if that's a painting but having that little bit of noise in the depth of your room while also seeing the little change in glass fuzz and the little highlights here and here, just showing you a little bit of an interior and a little bit of reflection at the same time. And that's going to make the glass feel really clean and crisp and realistic. Um, so if I was to go through and actually have interior walls of this whole thing and apply that layer to all of them, it would start to give that same effect everywhere and really start to bring this, uh, make that glass feel nice and realistic. Um, so I think I'm going to kind of stop with B right here. I think 